It's really my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. John Bienenstock. Dr. John Bienenstock is uh, internationally known as a physician and a mucosal immunologist. He trained at King's College in, Lon in London, and he holds the title of Distinguished University Professor at McMaster University, an honorary MD from Gothenburg, Sweden. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a member of the Order of Canada and is an inductee into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. So now you know why I need a paper to introduce Dr. John Bienestock, because <laughs> it's uh, very difficult to remember like, all the impressive things that he has done throughout his career. So uh, Dr. Bienestock is the founding director of the McMaster Brain Body Institute at St. Joseph Healthcare in Hamilton, and the former chair of pathology, and subsequently the dean and vice president of the Faculty of Health and Sciences at McMaster University. He has served as the president of the Canadian Society of Immunology, the Society for Mucosal Immunology, and the Collegium Internationale Allergologicum. He has published more than 500 peer-reviewed articles and other publications. He has authored, edited, or co-edited books, supervised about 60 postdoctoral fellows and 10 doctoral students. His current main areas of interest are the mechanisms of action of commensal bacteria on the nervous system and behavior, and in various models of inflammation. I think as he has been referred to as a living legend to me, and uh, he definitely is, so we are very honored that he has accepted to give a talk today, and we are looking forward to what he has to tell us. Please. You, you, re you really sometimes wonder, you know, uh, how long this is going to go on and whether you, this actually cuts out from my talk. <laughs> I just don't know how much time I've got left now to actually give the, give the, give the, give the talk. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back. I didn't know where the Fitzgerald building was, I have to say. Uh, I thought it was the best building, but I certainly know that one. Uh, uh, I think that it's worth uh, saying something about philanthropy, if you don't mind me, uh, me doing that. Um, philanthropy uh, is uh, what keeps us going, frankly. It isn't the government, it's, uh, it's philanthropy. And if it wasn't for you guys, uh, the Lawson family, uh, this none of this would be uh, happening. And uh, certainly I wouldn't be here, but uh, uh, it's uh, worth pointing out that uh, it's uh, very important and uh, it's very generous and uh, they don't have to give it. Uh, they don't have to give it here. And it's uh, our good fortune and your good fortune that, uh, that they have. So uh, my thanks to you and uh, all you've done for uh, Eleanor and the, uh, and the Institute. So, how do I kick this off here? Yeah. Hmm. Ah, this, okay, there I go. So these two guys are uh, basically uh, Richard Wu, who gave a talk last, uh, last time. Uh, uh, Wolfgang Kunz was uh, uh, basically instrumental in, uh, in working with uh, Richard at, uh, at Mac. And I work uh, extensively with, uh, with Wolf, who uh, is a neurophysiologist. So anything I have to say about neurophysiology is certainly his, and not, uh, not mine. Paul Forsyth is an immunologist, basically, and, uh, and I work extensively with, with uh, him, as does uh, Karen Ann, who will uh, we'll talk immediately, uh, immediately after. So I just thought we'd start with... Uh, I uh, don't know how many of you uh, are actually familiar with, uh, if you like, the, uh, the gut-brain axis, despite what uh, Phil Sherman uh, led you into last time. Uh, uh, this is really just to show you that uh, it's not just uh, rodents, it's not animals, it's not humans, it's, uh, it's also uh, basic commensal bacteria. And uh, this group, which is an Israeli group, uh, showed that if you fed, uh, basically, maybe I can use the pointer here, if you fed these, uh, these Drosophila, these fruit flies, on uh, different things, molasses on the left and uh, starch on the right, that's in fact, after 37 generations, the ones on the left were in fact uh, 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 interesting because they only mated uh, with, uh, if, if offered uh, those that had fed on starch, they only mated with the ones from molasses, uh, whereas the starch only mated with the ones from starch, which is pretty extraordinary. When it came to what's going on, uh, this particular uh, thing called speciation in, uh, in biology 
uh, was a result of particular organism alpine tarum that was present in the starch flies, but not really a present. And then you could actually show that the entire mating preference was due to a single organism, uh, namely, uh, namely uh, L. plantarum. Uh, and in fact, you could uh, eradicate this mating preference with an antibiotic. And then I'll talk a bit about antibiotics uh, later. So even in starch flies. So this is the schema that uh, I use often for, uh, to show uh, the gut. Uh, there's uh, a lot of immune cells in the gut, in pairs, patches, and lymphoid cells. Uh, there's a lot of bacteria out here. There's a bit of mucin here. Uh, they're talking constantly. Uh, this is a two-way street. Uh, and the products that they make, these uh, bacteria, fermentation, short-chain fatty acids, uh, propionic, uh, butyric, and uh, uh, lecetic, but they make all sorts of neuro, neurotransmitters as well. Uh, the one I talk about a lot, JB1, is uh, basically makes GABA, which is rather an important uh, neurotransmitter in the brain and uh, in terms of uh, uh, inhib inhibitory effects in the brain. But they also make gasotransmitters, which some of you may not be aware of, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, and H2S, all of which are found in the brain and synthesized by, uh, by uh, cells in the brain. So there, there is a communication that's occurring between this lot uh, and what's below. Uh, these are dendritic cells that, that are sampling uh, some of the uh, material out here, but they're also talking to the immune system uh, and especially uh, the spinal cord, vagus, and brain. So that's the, uh, that's the general system. Now, um, our colleagues, uh, uh, Chemek uh, Birchik, uh, at, uh, who works with uh, Steve Collins and the Farncombe Institute at, uh, at MAC, uh, basically they published a paper in uh, 2011 that was really a landmark uh, uh, paper. I'll show you a couple of landmark papers uh, as, we go, as we go through. Now, this landmark paper uh, took advantage of the fact that you got NIH Swiss, which are mice uh, that uh, are not really anxious, at least in the uh, methodologies that we use to detect behavior. Uh, and then you took valve Cs, which are anxious or exhibit anxiety-like behavior. And he transferred, uh, basically, the feces from one to the other. And the bottom line was that the NIH, when transferred uh, with valve C feces, became anxious, at least in these, this terminology, and the other became non-anxious. It's a landmark paper. Interestingly enough, it's not been repeated. Somebody out there in the audience should repeat this, uh, but uh, it uh, gives you an indication uh, of uh, how drastic and how ro uh, basically how robust some of these uh, systems are. However, we still don't know uh, uh, very much about these, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll probably uh, manage to uh, highlight how little we know as much as how much we know. Um, so there's lots of uh, work being done uh, showing that the gut microbes, uh, in fact, modulate brain. Uh, they modulate behavior. They modulate many things uh, in the nervous system. In fact, there's a whole list of things here. Uh, they modulate the uh, nervous system function. So we, we take germ-free mice. And, um, mo most, much of this work is not done by us. It has been done uh, around, around the world. Um, but the enteric nervous system is a particular interest of ours. They modulate brain uh, uh, microglia. I'm going to show you some of that. They modulate enterocromaffin cells, which are the bit of the cells in the, in, in the gut, the en enteroendocrine cells that uh, make most of the uh, 5-HT or serotonin. They modulate all sorts of synaptogenesis uh, and uh, BDNF in the brain, especially the hippocampus. They uh, modulate the stress response. I'm going to uh, show you a bit of that later. The broad brain barrier integrity and even the myelination of the prefrontal cortex as uh, shown by the uh, Cryon group. So here is a bunch of uh, enterochromaffin cells. Um, this is Elaine Shaw's work. Uh, that uh, I'm showing. Basically, here is the endocrine, the enteroendocrine cell. Uh, bacteria, particularly, they showed clostridia, of, uh, which was spore forming, could in fact mod modulate uh, the whole function of, uh, of this uh, particular cell type, increase, or uh, for that matter, other ways of decreasing, but increase uh, the amount of 5-HT that was synthesized, and showed that it was actually then secreted. Uh, actually locally uh, and was picked up as it usually is by uh, basically by, by platelets. 
and there was, in fact, clear-cut uh, stimulation of the local nervous system. Now, the, what is remarkable is that this is not just a, uh, depending on how you're, uh, you're manipulating these uh, animals and these systems. This isn't just uh, uh, a, a one-time event. And in this paper uh, that uh, was published in Nature Neuroscience a couple of years ago, uh, clearly shows that actually, uh, one way or the other, the, uh, the um, host microbiota constantly, and that's in the title, control the maturation of functions. So this isn't just a question of what are you, you going to do for Jan Free that's never seen a, a, a basically a microbe and give it a microbe. This is actually showing that in adult animals uh, over here that uh, you can actually, by antibiotic treatment, uh, uh, do exactly the same uh, as, uh, as you can uh, see in a germ-free animal. So this actually counts. Uh, we're constantly hearing about, uh, about this, and even in this animal world, uh, this is a serious matter because what we are beginning to find uh, that is, uh, is that uh, gender really, really does uh, make a difference. Many of the uh, experiments that we do, uh, or in fact all of the experiments that we do now almost, uh, are done with males and fe uh, male and female to compare them because they're so vastly different in many respects, not all respects, but many respects. <laughs> this is an example from Joe Clark in uh, John Klein's group in Cork, uh, showing that actually um, there, was, there are, in fact, sex-specific effects uh, in males in this case, but not female. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, let me go back. Uh, Germ-free. And that, in fact, uh, it, it, it goes as far as, uh, as affecting the behavior. Tryptophan, which is a precursor of, uh, of, of serotonin. And interestingly enough, when you conventionalize uh, these uh, germ-free animals, not everything is, uh, is, is changed. So, for example, the hippocampal uh, effect, which is increased, uh, is not actually brought back to normal, whereas the plasma tryptophan is and the behavior is. So not everything shifts, uh, basically. And this is a, a message uh, that I'm uh, going to generally give, uh, which is that uh, everything depends on the timing of uh, these uh, these. Um, attempts to change things. Social development effects uh, are also uh, found to be different in uh, basically in, uh, in uh, males and females. In this particular study, it's males that I'm showing you. But you can see that even in a, if you take a germ-free male mice, uh, you can see that social avoidance is, uh, is increased, novel social interactions are decreased. But when they're conventionalized, uh, basically, uh, the uh, novel social uh, interactions remain unchanged. So this is always, uh, or almost always, conventionalization means somewhere uh, post, obviously postnatally. So only some social uh, behavioral uh, um, uh, parameters, in fact, are changed by, uh, by the microbiome. And the message here clearly is that certain are imprinted. Now, how they're imprinted, when they're imprinted, uh, in terms of early life, is uh, is uh, subject of uh, basically of great interest. I'm going to click over that. So we carried out a study uh, which we published, uh, basically published last year, whoops, uh, in which we uh, looked at low dose penicillin. That's for roughly, it's about uh, well, it's 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 a childlike uh, pediatric dose. Let's put it that way. And uh, we gave it seven days before delivery through the weaning. And then uh, we examined them at six to eight weeks uh, of age. And uh, that is the offspring. And we looked at the boys and the girls. And uh, then we did all sorts of, uh, of uh, be behavioral tests. So day 21, uh, was it, which is weaning. And uh, Anne will talk about, uh, about what happens uh, if, if you... Uh, take that as the point of, uh, of uh, looking at uh, these animals and, uh, and giving them antibiotics. And then we compare what, what happened at uh, day, day, uh, day 42. Uh, this is an example, if you like, of what, uh, of what uh, occurred. All sorts of changes occurred, behavioral changes uh, as a result of uh, AB, stands for antibiotic. 
but we are at the same time in this particular model uh, uh, that we uh, that we uh, model experimentation that we did, uh, we gave uh, JB1, which is a lactobacillus, a lactobacillus rhamnosus, if you want, it's a probiotic, uh, basically uh, of uncertain uh, etiology. Uh, but uh, we've been using it now for uh, in the last eight or, ten, eight or ten years. And if we gave it at the same time, and I don't mean it exactly at the same time, we gave 12 hours of uh, basically of antibiotic and 12 hours of uh, uh, subsequent 12 hours of JB1. JB1 survives uh, that uh, particular, uh, some of them obviously killed by the antibiotic, which is penicillin, but you can see that antibiotic actually increased what is called anxiolytic activity. In other words, they became less anxious, not more anxious, as a result of the antibiotic. And uh, they also, uh, this was actually restored or uh, reverts to, uh, uh, it doesn't reach the same level of anxiety uh, le uh, of the anxiolytic activity, um, but they're restored to, uh, uh, to normal by, uh, by the presence of the antibiotic. So I'm going to flick over for some slides uh, as in order to try and keep uh, keep on time. Um, this is a, an analysis of the uh, the gut microbiome. Just look at the colours. Uh, this is these are the controls at three weeks and six weeks. Uh, these are the antibiotic treated. You can see clearly that uh, uh, all sort of the, these are actually Enterobacteriaceae, uh, particular uh, uh, bacterium that's uh, not found in large numbers in uh, in the controls. Uh, but you can see there are differences. They're not that great differences between the antibiotic and uh, treated versus the antibiotic treated with uh, JB1. And the fact is that the probiotic in our hands, work that Paul Forsyth is doing with uh, Adil Barwani, uh, that uh, basically the probiotic doesn't seem to change the uh, bacteria uh, uh, um, uh, community uh, that much. Uh, these are other forms of, uh, of, of uh, analysis that we, we do, look at uh, diversity, particularly regional or local. Uh, and you can see these are the controls over here, three weeks, six weeks. But you can see that the, uh, basically the, uh, the antibiotic treated and the antibiotic treated with a probiotic uh, cluster uh, together and away from the control. So that they're different, but they're not, uh, they're not uh, vastly changed. I told you about the Enterobacteriaceae. Most of these are proteobacteria. Uh, basically, again, you can see three weeks and six weeks, but by six weeks, uh, already everything is, is uh, down to almost normal. Uh, so there are changes at six, three to three, uh, at six weeks. But in fact, those changes are not uh, uh, basically um, uh, affected by, uh, basically by the proteobacteria. However, when we look at the brain and we start looking at cytokines, the inflammatory and pro-inflammatory and, and anti-inflammatory like IL-10 in both males and females, uh, you can see the, the gray uh, bars are actually the J, JB1 plus the antibiotic, the black are the antibiotic. You can see, especially in the females in this case, you can see uh, that there is in fact uh, inflammatory activity. And there are other things uh, in the frontal cortex, uh, particularly uh, both in males and females, that, cor that actually correlate uh, with a particular cytokine, uh, basically IL-6, or, or it's not actually IL-8 because the mouse doesn't have IL-8, it has an analog, uh, but we put IL-8 here. So there's tremendous correlation between the inflammatory changes that appear to be occurring in the frontal cortex simply by giving uh, this antibiotic in early life. This just sort of summarizes it. Uh, if I had lots of time, I'd show you uh, the increased aggression that occurred uh, in, in basically in roughly 50% of the animals at three weeks, especially especially or only the males who are not allowed to, uh, for ethical reasons, to, uh, to, do, to look, do the females uh, in this uh, particular test. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the half of them became very aggressive and, uh, and attacked if you like, the attacker. Uh, so uh, whether that has any uh, human counterpart or any relevance in, uh, in, uh, in clinical situation, we have no idea at the moment. But uh, this is where we get into serious speculation. So uh, there's been a lot of work uh, basically uh, done by, and this is particularly done uh, by uh, a group in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Sheridan uh, is... Uh, 
is a senior author there, but also Godboot and uh, basically and a number of people, Bailey, Mike Bailey as well. And they've shown that there are in fact uh, significant changes in uh, terms of uh, monocyte uh, invasion of, uh, the, of the mouse brain as a result of stress and particular types of stress. And they have observed uh, very recently now uh, that uh, in fact the reason this happens is that in the chronic defeat stress that, uh, that is the model uh, system, and here we're doing only males, uh, that uh, in fact activation occurs, uh, in the clear activation occurs here in different regions of the brain, but it occurs as a result of, uh, of endothelial, whoops, sorry, of endothelial activation, uh, which in turn uh, causes chemokine uh, um, IL-1 um, upregulation, which is cytokine, uh, which uh, brings in chemokines uh, and then recruits monocytes which are coming in from the spleen. So this inflammatory change that occurs as a result of chronic defeat stress, uh, basically, uh, uh, seems uh, to be uh, really quite important now in beginning to attempt uh, to translate this into, uh, into, the, uh, into the human situation. So how's this occurring? Well, it's interesting that when it, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of information out there uh, about a, a, a molecule called IL-6, interleukin-6, which most, uh, actually the uh, man who probably um, did most work in the earliest days of, of IL-6 is uh, somebody well known to so many of you in the audience, Jack Baldy uh, in, um, in, uh, at Mac. And uh, basically uh, what... Uh, so, I seem to have lost my. I've lost my arrow. Hmm? Ah. Can you see it here? Thank you. So um, the, the work that's been, uh, been done suggests that, in fact, IL-6 appears to be extremely important. Uh, and uh, you'll see uh, how that uh, seems to uh, basically fit into, uh, uh, fit into the, uh, uh, the pattern. And ten or more years ago, um, Phil um, uh, Patterson on the West Coast uh, in, uh, in California showed uh, basically, the maternal immune activation. He he, term, he was the first to use this term, maternal immune activation. He used uh, particularly uh, poly IC. Poly IC mimics uh, uh, viral infection, and he showed uh, that uh, basically, and this is just an example of uh, where the mice are in an open field. He showed that in, in poly IC treated uh, animals, uh, treated you'll see at a particular time. Uh, in the uh, basically in their life, that they in fact uh, display a completely different pattern of of, uh, of, locomo of locomotion, and if he then uh, put in a receptor antagonist for IL six, uh, he could restore that uh, that uh, pattern of, migra of of locomotion to uh, to normal. That's just the bar graph showing uh, showing that, that he actually did that. Now, where is this occurring is, uh, is really uh, starting to get very interesting. Uh, and in fact, uh, this particular paper last year uh, showed the maternal immune activation. So you give the, uh, the poly-IC, in, in fact, at uh, day 12.5, and that's a crucial issue. Uh, in fact, uh, and uh, lo and behold, uh, what happens is that the placenta starts to make uh, increasing amounts of, uh, of IL-6. And surprisingly, it's the trophoblast in the placenta that's seeming, seemingly making, the, uh, making this, uh, this particular cytokine. And basically what these guys have shown is that if you block that uh, uh, again, uh, you can uh, restore to normal what, uh, uh, what otherwise, uh, otherwise happens, which is in fact serious uh, disruption of uh, brain, uh, brain pathways. In the other thing that uh, has come up now is again, this is again maternal inflammation, again poly IC, and it's again uh, a day uh, 12.5. This alters uh, the amount of 5-HT that's actually synthesized in the, in the placenta. And in fact, uh, the, uh, these, uh, this group, Godin and, and, and on the Journal of Neuroscience showed 
uh, that the amount of 5-HT that is made in the, in the placenta is absolutely uh, uh, the uh, cause of significant uh, serotonergic axon outgrowth uh, change. So we've got IL-6, we've got uh, 5-HT, and these two things are being affected in this particular way. This is an autism model. I'm, I'm going a bit s slow, and I'm uh, going to speed up. Uh, so... Uh, I won't talk about the autism model. We can talk about it if you like. Uh, is it a real model of, uh, of uh, autism? I, I personally don't think it is. It, it helps us a bit. Uh, but the, that was a maternal uh, inflammation model. Now, this was uh, an interesting uh, observation as well, that uh, when it comes to uh, bacterial peptidoglycans, uh, components of the uh, cell wall of uh, especially gram-positives, uh, here we've got uh, uh, strep pneumoniae uh, with, with peptidoglycan. If you inject those roughly at the same time into a pregnant uh, mouse, you see all sorts of big-time big changes, 50% more neurons in the cortical plate, for example, associated with abnormal behavior. Uh, but that in fact, uh, that is as a result of the peptidoglycan crossing the blood-brain barrier and in fact uh, doing all the damage. However, when they gave it in day 15 of, uh, basically, of, uh, of uh, pregnancy, uh, they couldn't find it. So we're back now to this business about timing and when, uh, in fact, in the course of pregnancy, you're seeing uh, these changes occurring. So that becomes, uh, becomes a crucial issue. Now, this is a landmark paper, again, of pseudos. Uh, most, many of us, uh, actually, pseudo came and did a, did a sabbatical uh, uh, with us. But uh, we, um, uh, his paper was, was, was landmark because he showed that stress responses in germ-free mice uh, were, in fact, exaggerated. Here we can see, uh, actually, uh, uh, you can see this is in a germ-free mouse. And you can, uh, what we're looking at is corticosterone as a result of acute stress. And it's completely exaggerated relative to, uh, basically, to normal, normal response. He then went on to look and I never found out why he did the experiment at that time. It wasn't, a, it wasn't obvious. To see whether the germ-free mice, uh, in fact, when he conventionalized them or gave particular organisms from uh, fecal uh, material, whether, in fact, he could revert that to normality. And he could, but only if he did it, uh, basically, early in development. If he gave it after weaning, nothing happened. No change occurred. Again, we've got, we've got this, uh, this crucial uh, issue of, of development and uh, development modulation. So we, we're, we're on to David uh, Barker, uh, who uh, in fact is thought to be or uh, is regarded as uh, having this uh, being the originator of the fetal programming hypothesis, which uh, in fact is uh, where all this is, uh, is, uh, is leading. Now, in fact... Uh, so the question is, uh, that obviously, that many of you have is, so what's all this stuff in any case about mice? Does it have anything to do with, uh, with clinical, uh, our, cl our clinical uh, uh, acumen and what we know? And interestingly, uh, this is uh, 300,000 males that were looked at uh, at military induction uh, who uh, were well recorded as being uh, the offspring of mothers uh, who either in, in the Dutch famine, that was 1944 to 45, uh, when the uh, Germans were occupying, uh, occupying Holland and basically showed that the first six months, the offspring were, had a much higher obesity rate, uh, whereas if, the, the, uh, if they'd been exposed in the first few months, uh, there was a much lower uh, obesity rate. In fact, this is transgenerational. I'm not going to go through it, but it is transgenerational in, in, into the F2. So... With the, the question uh, clearly, clearly is, uh, is whether or not uh, that, that occurs in the human. And there's considerable discussion and debate as to, as to how much, uh, uh, in fact, we, that we're seeing in mice where it clearly does occur is, in fact, uh, present in, uh, in terms of the human. I'm getting to the end, but the, the, this is the, uh, a paper recently that, uh, relatively recently, that was uh, published by Costa Mattioli, who at that time was in Canada uh, and is now in Houston. And basically, they were looking at, uh, at uh, maternal, uh, this maternal uh, high-fat diets, 
and the question, it was well known, uh, that in fact uh, maternal high fat diets led, led uh, to changes in the, in the microbiome uh, which were relatively, uh, uh, you, could, you could identify those changes, uh, but uh, at the same time, what he then went on to look at was social behavior and showed that actually following a uh, high-fat diet, the, the maternal behavior, sorry, the, uh, the child's uh, children behavior was, uh, was actually impaired. But then he went on to look at uh, basically various things in the paraventricular nucleus and showed also that oxytocin, which was a surprising molecule uh, in this uh, respect, was in fact uh, basically... Uh, uh, impaired in terms of amounts. And he then went on to show that uh, lactobacillus reutery, which he picked out of the blue, uh, if he gave that, that was like my JB1, that in fact all of this was, uh, was restored to normal. The interesting, really, really interesting thing was that he could restore the whole thing to normal if he gave nasal oxytocin. In other words, getting the, the oxytocin into the, into, into the brain, looking as if much of what was going on was actually due to oxytocin. It's surprising, but uh, he, he quotes these papers, which uh, he, he wasn't aware of the fact that these papers had been published before him, and that, in fact, this particular uh, organism, which, he's, uh, which he picked out of the blue, 6475, Reutery, uh, was, in fact, uh, uh, clearly, uh, as shown by Pudahides, uh, uh, in, uh, able by itself uh, in a maternal fat uh, uh, diet like uh, like he used uh, to uh, prevent the uh, this is the fat uh, pad in the epididymis to prevent the fat pad occurring, but he also showed that this particular uh, organism only uh, worked if uh, in fact the vagus nerve was present intact now that to us was uh, was uh, uh, manner to, from heaven because we had shown a few years previously uh, that vagotomy, uh, actually cutting the main trunk of uh, the sensory afferent uh, system to the brain, uh, in fact, uh, of, in this anxious uh, mouse, uh, basically, which showed less anxiety and stress responses, in fact, uh, you could uh, make the animal much more normal if you gave this probiotic, but if you gave uh, this probiotic to an animal that had its vagus nerve cut, uh, this didn't occur. So we are of the belief system now that uh, really, when it comes down to it, the vagus is really key, not to all uh, organisms, but to, to these, uh, basically, many of these uh, messages that are going from the gut, that are influenced by the, uh, by, the, by the microbiome, whether it's the stuff they produce, whether it's the actual uh, uh, stimulation of the vagus itself, we're not sure. But it's interesting that the vagus uh, nerve can be stimulated by, in, by implanted uh, uh, devices, basically. And there's now a five-year observational study showing that electrical stimulation of uh, the vagus in uh, depressed patients who are in intractable, in other words, uh, they're, they're not responding at all to, to therapy, actually uh, basically enhances the antidepressive effects and, uh, and is a, mo well, a very well-recognized FDA mode of, uh, of treatment. So is there any information on this? Almost nothing in terms of humans. Uh, obviously, an antibiotic is not given uh, unless there is an infection. We don't know whether, whether the infections are uh, what uh, are actually causing uh, some of these things, potentially. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, being done in this area. We, don't, we will find out much later. Uh, and uh, we have a whole range of uh, molecules and systems that, uh, that we're trying to look at. And I leave you with, I leave you with this thought, uh, that uh, when it comes down to it, you can make everything right, and, uh, and you can have uh, clean water and clean air and plenty of exercise, and everything's organic, but uh, you don't live past 30 if you're a hunter-gatherer, which uh, uh, leaves us uh, with, uh, with some problems and issues. So I hope I haven't gone on too long. I apologize if I have, uh, but I had a good time one way or the other.